This sermon this morning is, is, is not about, and many sermons go like this, that, okay, if you will listen to the sermon and you'll do what it says, it will change your life for the better. Now, we should hope that in every sermon that we preach, every message that we deliver. But I would like to say that today's message is not so much about changing your life for the better. It is about changing somebody else's life for the better. Can you say amen? It, it's, it's not about you. And it's about God and it's about others. The greatest command is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in that, we will find our fulfillment uh, in our lives. If we miss that, we, we simply will not be fulfilled the way God intended us to be. So uh, today, it really is about, uh, about changing someone else's life. Have you thought much about you being involved in a relationship, because that's what I've been talking about, with other people for their benefit, for their good, for their advancement, for their growth? Have you thought about making somebody else's life better. So I want you to think a little bit this morning about some people that are in your life. You know, we had this circle of influence. It started with you. It went out to your immediate family, and then it grew from there to acquaintances and people you'll only meet maybe one time in your life. But God has arranged those people to rub shoulders and touch your life. It's no accident, anything that happens, and especially with uh, relationships. And I, 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 I wrote down a statement. As we think about leaving a legacy, because all of us know that we came into our lives, you know, through a door. Mine started in 1960, and some of yours is before and after that. But my life started... Then, I was physically born, I came to know Jesus a little bit later in history. At 18 years old, I gave my life to him, followed him, and then I understood I was uh, brought into uh, a new realm where I was living not for myself, but for him, not for my kingdom, but his, not for the world, but for him. And so God gave me gifts, and God gave me his grace, and God gave me something to do. And that something to do between that door of where I came to know him and the exit, which is in the future. One day I will walk through that door and I will depart this world and I will leave that mission. And that is true with any individual. Many people are saying, uh, Billy Graham is still alive. Who's going to pick up after he's gone. Well, folks, they said that when D.L. Moody was here. They said that when Spurgeon was here. They said that when other great men uh, came and left, and women came and left, and you all know that you will leave someday because there is no one that has not made their entrance and made their exit, and that will be true for you and me. Death and taxes, you can be assured of if you live in the United States. So the fact is, is that what am I going to do between that entrance into salvation and that exit? And obviously, I think a really smart thing to do is to understand that there are going to be ever people, other men and women, other boys and girls that are going to be left beyond to carry on the task. And my message to you today is a lot about leaving the legacy. And this is what I wrote. It's not so much what you leave behind, but who you leave behind. Can you say amen? It's not about possessions, and it's not about, you know, uh, things that uh, we can see so much uh, as physical objects and money and power and prestige. It's about people. So it's not about what I'm going to leave behind. It's about who I'm going to leave by, behind. And what is my affluence going to do with my influence, which is most important? And I'd like us to turn our thoughts as we think about this message today that 
we would consider a relay race. Now, all of us know that in order to get to the finish line in a relay race, it's not about having a bunch of individuals that are really fast. Would you agree with that? It's about their ability to work together as a team, capitalizing on their strengths, and the race is lost or won in the passing of the baton. And if the baton is not quickly, effectively passed to the next runner, all of you know that there is that really sinking feeling when you're going to pass it on and you're not sure if they have it, and sometimes we're sure they have it, but we don't want to let go. <laughs> but we must let go in order for them to do their part and for the team to cross the finish line victorious together. And I believe the church is a team. How about you? It's not made of Lone Rangers, and it shouldn't be. And so as we pass the baton, I, I want to say, have you considered who are you passing the baton to? Is it your son or your daughter? Is it a friend? And as we consider the scripture today and we look at Paul and Timothy, I especially want to relate to you that are older. How many of you consider yourself older? I saw some hands go up. Some of you may be reluctant to raise your hand, but there are certain things that tell the story. <laughs> like the letter I received the other day from the AARP, <laughs> which I'm not sure if I'm going or not. But the fact is, is that some of us are growing older. We understand we're more closer to the exit than we are the entrance. And we've just got to pass on what God has so graciously delivered to us. And it's vital to the church, and it's vital to the kingdom. Who do you have in mind? So a couple things as I begin, which I know we have the Lord's Supper today, and this is it. What will prevent you from passing it on? One is pride. Because pride says, there's really no one who can do what I do better than I do. And so, therefore, I don't want to give this job away because they simply won't do it like I did or as good as I did. And that can be applied to mowing the lawn or doing the dishes, or teaching a class, or maybe even cooking. So don't let pride stop you from passing it on, especially to the next generation. The other thing that will stop you is perfectionism. Well, I'm not sure I can pass it on because I really haven't perfected this yet. And so who am I to turn to someone else to say, follow me as I follow Christ because my following isn't exactly perfect now. And I want to reflect that the Apostle Paul, I feel, is probably one of the most mature, advanced Christians who ever lived. And there were times where Paul said, I haven't arrived. Can you say amen? And did he deal with things like passion? He said, yeah, don't I still inwardly burn at times? And so if Paul were thinking, well, I'm not the best example, and we can look at scriptures where you can see his imperfections plainly, you may feel, who am I? But how many of you are glad that in spite of Paul's imperfections, that he passed it on? So don't wait. I know pastors that said, I'm working on my congregation, and I'm going to I'm gonna get them really mature before we really do much of anything. You'll be waiting a long, 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 long time. As a matter of fact, he's died and gone on with the Lord. Then you know his congregation is still not perfect. And the fact is, they really didn't do a whole lot. And I want to tell you that uh, the last thing is passivity, and that means you're just passive. I don't care. 
if I pass anything on. I'm just going through life. And I want you to know, dear brother or dear sister, whether you want to or not, you are teaching every day. Have you ever heard the statement, like father, like, like mother, like? Isn't it a scary thing sometimes when we see our behavior show up in our children? And you realize, wow, for good or bad, they're a lot like me. Oh, they're a lot like me. So you're teaching regardless, and you're passing something on, whether you want to or not. So instead of being passive about it, let's be active. Can you say amen? Let's be active, and let's pass on intentionally the very best we have, especially to the next generation. And with that, this morning, we're going to turn to the scriptures, which I absolutely Love the Word of God. How many of you love the Word of God this morning? How blessed we are to have the Word of God to to look to. And we're going to look at Paul and Timothy this morning, and we're going to look at what he passed on. And I want to encourage you, these three things that I'm talking about this morning, you need to give away to your son or your daughter or your uncle or your aunt or your coworker. You need to give this away. You need to give it away And it's very important that we do. It can make all the difference in the life of someone else. It could change their life. You, with God's help, can change somebody else's life for the better. How many of you are excited about that prospect? I can make the world a better place by my being willing to be able to minister and to mentor someone else. And ministry basically means to just help. And are you willing to help someone else? This is the best way you can really help someone else. Now, here we are in the ministry of education. The ministry of education. And notice as Paul speaks to Timothy. We know that somehow, just after Paul's first imprisonment, he ended up in acquaintance with Timothy and with his grandmother and with his mother. There talked about in Scripture. A connection was made through the Apostle Paul and this young Timothy. Timothy ends up at an Ephesian church and serves for a while with the Apostle Paul. So we have 1 Timothy that takes place around 64 or so. Then 2 Timothy, Paul finds himself back in jail. Some feel like the statute of limitations must have run out on Paul. He was released for a period of time, had freedom, then ends up again in prison for his faith. Second Timothy was written during that time while he was in prison. So you are entering into a very intimate communication of an older man in Christ and a younger man. And Paul models for us how to effectively pass it on to the next generation, which he successfully did. So the ministry of education, I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor devote themselves to myth and endless genealogies. Now, sadly enough, as Paul and Timothy went away from the Ephesian church, and you can read the letter to the Ephesians, when they returned, what they found was not good. The church was being saturated and infiltrated by false doctrine. And I'm just going to tell you, your doctrine is very, very important. That's why I urge you, like every week, would you please consider coming to Bible study? Would you please consider coming to Sunday school? Would you please get yourself and be in a class and be a student and learn? And this is the way its simple equation is. If you have bad, diseased, corrupted doctrine, it will affect your life in a negative way. And not only you, because our message today is not about you, it's about others. Not only will it affect you in a bad way, it'll affect your children. It'll affect those that live around you. But this is the good side. Correct, healthy doctrine, real truth will 
your life, transform your life for the better, but not only you, it'll transform who else's life. Your son, your daughter, your friends, your neighbors. So it's critical that you have correct doctrine. So Paul is emphasizing it's so important that we teach. I'm very grateful for the teaching ministry of our church. Can you say amen today? And I'm thankful for the leader, Sister Sue is in that position right now. It's great to see the number of classes that are offered and what the topics are. And what is being taught in our church is vital to produce stable lives. And I have to say this, you know, Sister Sue's not going to last forever. Isn't that true? (laughs) Just not here. Her address will change someday when she gets to that door. And I hope that lasts a long time. But one day you'll be coming to this church and this pulpit will not have Pastor Sam Macri because it's my 25th anniversary and just how long do you think I'll last? Well, thank you very much uh, for that. But who knows what the future holds? So I need to be challenged. You need to be challenged. Who's going to take our place? It's that simple. Do you think that Paul contemplated, well, I went to prison. I was there for a while, and I got out. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm back in prison. Oh, there's a guy named Nero now. Nero's not so nice. Do you think that he considered that he might not survive much longer? And what he was going to do. So guess what he did? He sat down with pen and paper, and the Holy Spirit aided him. And he prepared a young man named Timothy and Titus and others to carry on the work. Are you doing that with anybody? Have you picked out anyone and said, I've got to pass this on. I I have got to engage people. I have got to confront people. I have got to teach and instruct people because I know how this goes and has gone So here is Timothy admonished about how important education, education, education is. And false doctrine will lead to a faulty life, but good doctrine will lead to a blessed, healthy life. And we need to consider that. These people had gotten involved in angel worship, genealogies in the Old Testament, in endless arguments about things that didn't mean a bag of beans. Can the church do that today? Spin their wheels, talk about stuff that has really no importance and no relevance while the lost world goes marching on and how careful we need to be about that. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. And the goal of this command is love. And I want to say to you, the reason, you had three reasons that you wouldn't pass it on. And that would be your pride. The other would be you're just passive. And the other would be you're a perfectionist. But you have one good reason to pass it on, and it's love. Can you say amen? Because you love people. Because you love the church. How many have enjoyed worship today? I had a ball. Just had a great time worshiping God together. I missed it when I wasn't here. We need to make sure this is still here 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. And you say, whoa, that's, that's, that's really broadcasting. Clinton Road Baptist Church is over 50 years old now. We're not a youngster anymore. And have we effectively passed it on? So let's do it because we love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. If you're going to serve the Lord or engage somebody else, let it be for love. Love is the greatest thing the world has ever known and ever will be knowing, is love. So let's do it because we simply love God and we love other people. So if you play the guitar and you're involved in the worship band, 
My clicker's not working. What should you do? It's quiet. If you play guitar and you are playing in the band of worship, what should these guys be doing? If it's not about them or the trumpet player, what should they be doing? Somebody tell me. What's what, 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 what? Shouldn't they be picking out some young men or young women who have a little bit of a heart for music and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ? And I'm not telling them what to do, or am I? (laughs) Isn't it great that Victor has taken some of our young guys who couldn't read a note, and now they're over there, and they have a little stage, and they're playing, but before you know it, they'll be here. And thank God they'll be here, and there won't be a vacancy. Amen? And in our classes, we've got to teach other teachers to teach. Because we need more classes. Would you say amen to that? Okay. And what about ministries that this church does? Are we going to be able to say, I'm training someone to take my spot. And I'll go do something else. But then I'll go ahead and I'll make sure that there are people that are going to take my place. Will the church be blessed? Will the community be blessed? Will other people be blessed? So what are, you, what are you passing on? It's so important that we do that. And then this. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Notice, sound teaching, a pattern that Paul is talking about. He was a living example. He said, I'm instructing you. I'm giving you advice about worship. I'm giving you advice about church leaders and how to select them and what their qualifications are. I'm giving you advice in the scriptures about how do you deal with false doctrines that are coming into your church. He's instructing. And you and I need to do the same kind of thing as we think about education. Education is a great thing. My son called me up the other day his lawnmower was down. I said, what's going on with it? He said, well, it's one of the bearings or spindles or something like that. Same thing happened to my lawnmower. I didn't know. I went to the store the first time, and uh, I went to a parts store. I said, this is what I got to have. They showed me the whole assembly. It cost me over 100 bucks. That doesn't matter much to you because that wasn't your $100. It was mine. But later on, I came back, another one broke, another guy at the counter, and he said, you know that whole assembly can be broken down, and you can just be by this part. Guess how much this part was? Ten bucks. Now, I didn't think bad about the other guy, did I? (laughs) I talked to my son on the phone, and I said, son, I had the same problem. Is this simple? I said, did you know you can break that thing down? You might be able to just get the bearings out of it, replace the bearings, put it back together. He called me up yesterday. He said, Dad, it's really great. I replaced the bearings in that. It all came apart. My lawnmower is running great. I feel good that I did that. Praise God. For some of your ladies, you can cook like there's no tomorrow. I mean, people just eat their fingers when they come to your house. Your daughter-in-law calls you up. She doesn't know how to cook a turkey. She doesn't know which way is up. We had to explain that there's stuff inside the turkey. (laughs) Amen. Any of you ever made that mistake? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering. I I cooked it all, you know. But there's stuff inside the turkey. Yeah, there is. Who's going to tell you that? The grocery clerk doesn't tell you that. But isn't it great when a mother can turn to a daughter and say, do it like this? Isn't it wonderful when your kid gets diaper rash? And some parents are really struggling. And I had a grandfather who said, I went over to the house, fixed it real easy. I just took those bottoms off. And he just ran around. Diaper rash cleared right up. No doctors, no medication. Just a little nudity solved the problem. How do you learn that kind of stuff? 
Oh man, you learn it from people who've been there and been through it. Do you know you're a treasure house of experience and information? And some of you are really gifted when it comes to the Word of God. Where you can share that and pass it on. Is, do you have to be perfect? No. Do you have to be passive? No. You don't. Do you have to be prideful? Believe it or not, if you teach someone else to do what you do, the scary thing is, is they'll do it better than you did. And then God gets the glory and not you. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And things you have heard me say in the presence of many in witnesses, entrust, so let's say this together, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. What was Paul knowing in his mind? He said, I'm going to pass it to Timothy, but Timothy's got to pass it to what? To still others. How many of you are glad that the gospel gave it all the way down to you in 2000? And that's God's process. You're sitting there, what can I do for the church? You can simply bring your gifts, bring your talents, bring what you have. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be passive. You don't have to be prideful. And God will use you in ways you never imagined. The guys that did our vacation Bible school this year, it's the first time they ever did it. What do you think about the job they did? Praise God. They're going to be back next year. Here's my thought, though. They could hold on to that. They could become comfortable with that. We'll do that this year, and we'll do it next year, and then we'll do it the year after that. Not that I'm forecasting. I'm doing what I'm going to talk about next. But wouldn't it be great if they got a couple of other people, never did it before either, and say, we've done it, now it's your turn. And we're going to support you, and we're going to help you, and you're going to be a success. Isn't that better than the buck stops with me? Don't take any offense, some of you. Paul knew that. Timothy knew it. And then the ministry of exhortation. What is exhortation? Does anybody know? I had to look it up and write it down. It's a biblical term. You don't hear it much often. But this is simply uh, what it, what it, it means. Is if I can find it here. Uh, it means, oh, I didn't write it down. So I'll have to make it up. <laughs> no, uh, here it is. I found it. Definition, an address or communication strongly urging someone to do something. And here's what's attached to it. Persuasion, pressure, and warning. Have you ever felt maybe in our day and age it was a little politically incorrect to tell somebody, if you don't do this, there's going to be consequences. That doesn't sound nice, does it? But did you know the scripture is full of that kind of communication? How many of you are glad? God warns us. And that's what he tells. He says, there's some things you stay away from and don't go there. And there's other things you need to embrace and you need to be involved in. But have you noticed that sometimes some people need a little push? And you may be one. And is it all right for you to push someone? It doesn't sound right, but the fact is, it's very scriptural. We say it another way in our culture. Have you ever thought that your husband needed a good boot? And I don't mean like starting up your computer. Let's put it more nicely. He needed a little motivation. Have you ever felt like your son needed a little boot? Or your daughter needed a little boot. And because you didn't boot them, the behavior went on and all the negative stuff attached to it. Is it proper sometimes just to give people a good boot? Yeah, it is. And the Apostle Paul is exhorting, he's putting pressure on Timothy 
but he's doing it for his good and God's glory. But you, O man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godless, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, which you were called. Charles Swindoll, as he looked at these verses, he said, notice the action verbs here. Notice what it says, flee. What does it mean to flee? Do you remember when Joseph was being tempted by Potiphar's wife, what did he do? Was he indifferent? Or the Bible says he put on his track shoes and he got out of there. He ran, and for good reason. Are there some things that you and I, the Bible says, be careful that you think you're standing. Because when you think you're standing, you could what? You could fall. So there is a warning from the scriptures. Because all of us have feet of clay and there is warning. Do you sometimes need to warn somebody that you love? Absolutely. Action verbs. Flee. Pursue. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. There's so much activity involved in what Paul is saying. And boy, sometimes we just simply, simply need it. Notice what uh, he says. When you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He's, he's talking to Timothy in strong terms. Letting him know. He's correcting. He is convicting. He is showing the way. Because he really, really cares about this young man. Nope, can you back up one? Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. If you read the book of Timothy, you will see this theme over and over again. Some have wandered from the faith. Some have shipwrecked their faith. He is warning, warning, warning. We can't always do that. That shouldn't be all of what our exhortation is about. But we ought to make sure we don't neglect that as well. So maybe is there someone you're giving a push? Is there someone you are putting a little pressure on? If there is someone that you are warning, that's a good thing and not a bad thing, as long as it's done in love. And notice this verse. For this reason, I remind you, to f remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Why do you suppose Paul told Timothy, fan the flame? What does that mean? It means that the flame was low. The passion wasn't there. But there was passivity and there was timidity and it wasn't a time to be timid or passive. And so Timothy fanned the flame. Every one of you who knows Jesus has not only one spiritual gift, you get that on conversion, but you have many. What have you done with the gifts and the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given you? What have I done? And so sometimes we need to fan it in the flame in our lives. Are you passive? Are you, God saying, you need to be more involved so other people can be more involved, whatever your ministry might be. And so fan the flame this morning in your life. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. How is your witness are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you afraid to talk to people about Jesus? And Paul is turning and saying to Timothy and to us, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of your Lord. Speak up for him. We can speak up for Jesus at the grocery store. Can you say amen? We can do that. We can do that, and some of us are afraid in our offices to mention the name of Jesus because of our times. I want you to know, where is our allegiance? Where does it lie? Who do we love most? What do we fear most? And standing up for Jesus is very, very important. And so are we an active witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
not because of anything we have done, because God's been so good to us because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior. So Paul is exhorting young Timothy, and thank God that he did. Timothy went to work in Ephesus and was successful, moved on to other areas because the Apostle Paul's clock was ticking, and so was ours, or is ours, excuse me. Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel, reminding him of the goodness of God. And then finally, the ministry of encouragement. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Why was Timothy crying? It's because they were parted. Timothy was not going to have the luxury of the Apostle Paul. And some of you that are being exhorted, you're thinking this person is going to be here forever. And they're not. The fact is, they'll enter your life and they'll leave your life. Are you listening to their exhortation? Are you looking and seeing their teaching, not only verbally, but are you seeing it as they live the example before you? Are you taking it to heart knowing that I may only have this relationship with this person so long? So Timothy was in tears when the Apostle Paul had to go back into prison, and now they were parted, and he was kind of on his own, except for these letters, and except for the memories that he had of the Apostle Paul. So please, let's take to heart the time that we have and how precious are the people in our lives that God put in our path who are our mentors, how thankful we should be for the people who helped make us what we are today. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. Not only did Paul express his care, I longed to see you. It was emotional. He loved Timothy. But he also expressed his confidence in young Timothy. He believed in him. You know, people need someone to believe in them. Are you going to be that person who calls a person out to what they are now and what they could be in the future? And you may be the only voice in their life that's breathing encouragement into their lives. I'm reminded this time of year about the geese. Have you seen them? And have you heard them? You heard them first. And the other day I was out in my backyard. It was yesterday. I could hear the honking of the geese and they were flying low. Aren't they beautiful? And they were flying in that V formation, and they were just honking their little hearts out as they were going over. And you know the reason why the geese fly in that formation? Someone has to get in the front, and if you're in the front, what happens to you when you're in the front? When you're out in the lead, what happens to the person in the lead? Any person in the army will know that's where you take the most hits. And so that geese gets out in the front and he's taking the most pressure and then that is kind of diverted to the others and they have less and less and less. But when that geese that's in the front gets tired, guess where he goes? He goes to the back of the line and someone else has to come forward. And they tell me that geese instinctively know the thing that motivates the geese in the front the most is if they honk. And the, how, the louder they honk, the better they do and the longer they last. That's an amazing thing. So they have every reason to honk to encourage each other because they have a long journey. I think that applies to the church. Don't you? It's a long journey. And sometimes when we travel together, because we are human beings, we do everything but encourage. Can you say amen to that? And instead of encouragement, this is what we do. Are we there yet? Have you ever heard that? And you must have taken a wrong turn. Or do you really know where you're going? And we criticize and we complain. 
And I'm not just saying this in light of Pastor Appreciation Sunday. But the fact is, wouldn't it be better if we just did not do that and we honked for our leaders and when they got tired, we came to their aid? Can you say amen? We took over. Brothers and sisters, it's time for some of you to take over. It's time for some of you to step up. You, you, you've been listening, you've been learning for a long time. But isn't it time for you to give back? So consider God's message to your heart this morning. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from interview you have known the Holy Scriptures, how important they are. To all of us, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed, is useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Sounds like exhortation to me. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's exactly what God wants us to be, wants us to be equipped for every good good work. In the presence of God, this is the, Paul's final charge to Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and he will, and in view of this, his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared, ready or not, in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Are we going to be those kind of people? Now, where did Paul get this? As I close. At the beginning of the Lord Jesus' ministry, you will find him stealing away to pray all night long. You know what he prays for? The next day, he's going to go out and he's going to select, begin selecting 12 men. We call them the 12 apostles. He had three and a half years to impart his faith, his life, his ministry, and his mission. And how did Jesus choose to reach the world for himself? Well, he picked people a lot like you and a lot like me. And those people effectively passed it on to still others and still others. And here we are today. My question is, where will we be tomorrow? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word. It's an amazing word. And I want to thank you for the relationships that we have looked at thus far. Paul was an older man at this time. He knew a little bit about what lay ahead for him. His departure was imminent. He did the wisest thing in the world. And that is he effectively passed on his faith. He wasn't prideful. He wasn't passive. Father, instead, he was a man who understood and he passed it on to Timothy and Titus and still other faithful men and challenged them. We thank you for the way that the church works. I can remember years ago sitting in the back of the church hearing the gospel for the very first time. I can remember walking the aisle and individuals being interested in me and helping me to learn the word of God. I remember much study on my own with your spirit. And Lord, then you led me to follow you in full-time ministry, to be a pastor, now pastoring this church 25 years. Seems like yesterday, in my bedroom, I said, come and save me. Come and change me. Come and use me, oh God. And you did, and you have. But Lord, it's not about me. And it's not about any individual in this church today. It's about those that are around our lives. 
They're just as called, just as gifted, just as loved. But they need us to be part, Lord, of their education, part of their exhortation, Father. And I pray that we will. And Lord, I want to thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. The many willing people and the future that lies in front of us. But Lord, help us to be people that will pass it on. Help me to hand the baton to my son, my daughter-in-law is now. Help me to pass it on to my friends at church. Help me to pass it on to my neighborhood. And Lord, I just pray for us here that it understood, Lord, that it's the very best thing that we could do. So we love you today and we entrust this time to you, Father. If there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus, I pray, Father, that the message is loud and clear to them because God may be calling them, you may be calling them to yourself because it's all part of your plan and purpose. And I pray, Father, that they will heed your call and they will respond to you in faith by admitting they're a sinner, turning away from their sin, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then beginning that journey of living for you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Let's all stand.